Well, welcome everyone to the Aspatuck Land Trust Special Sunday Brunch Lecture. Today, we're delighted to have today's speaker, Dr. Doug Tallamy, here with us live from his home in Pennsylvania to talk about the nature of oaks. My name is Jean Stetspachowski, and I'll be moderate, moderator of today's lecture. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few of the technical details of Zoom. So you'll find for those familiar with, with Zoom, you'll notice that at the bottom of the screen, you have a set of controls. So for those unfamiliar, you can take your cursor, move right along the bottom of your screen, and you'll notice a number of features. Today, we'll be utilizing the Q&A and the chat feature. We will not be using the raise hand feature. We encourage you to, uh, as you go, put questions in either the chat or the Q&A. We'll be curating these questions for Doug and Mel today as we go, and we will answer questions at the end of Dr. Tallamy's presentation. So I'd like to now introduce Mary Ellen LeMay, the Director of Landowner Engagement for Aspatuck Land Trust to kick off today's program. Great, thank you very much, Jean, and welcome everybody. Um, Jean gets a special thank you today as a, a longtime supporter of the Aspatuck Land Trust and she consistently shares her expertise as a Zoom expert and executive coach at her company, Individual Differences. And we are so thankful for her time today and sharing uh, her expertise. Um, I also have another thank you before we begin um, to the professionals at Growing Solutions Landscape Design for sponsoring Dr. Tallamy's lecture today. Uh, Brid Craddock and Paul Vujasanti are masters at integrating ecological design and management into their clients' landscapes. They're truly walking the talk of bringing nature home. So thank you to the entire team at Growing Solutions for the unique work that they're doing and for sponsoring the talk today. Um, so as people still come in and they're making their way in from cyberspace into our webinar today, I'd like to take this opportunity to provide a quick two minute snapshot video of the Aspatuck Land Trust Green Corridor Initiative. Many people on today are members and others are not. So we wanted to share with you how important the work is that we're doing to connect our nature preserves and our yards in a goal to trying to improve biodiversity in our region and beyond. So if you'll bear with me, I will share this video as uh, more people come in. And I think you'll enjoy it. And Doug Tallamy is in this video as well. So it's a nice entree to him. Imagine a Fairfield County where the beauty of our land is preserved, where birds and insects flourish and natural species thrive, where people have more preserved lands to enjoy, drinking water is pure and flooding is diminished. Here at Aspatuck Land Trust, we are making this happen and encouraging others to support our Green Corridor mission. Part one of the Green Corridor is protecting land. We are preserving strategically located land parcels in our six town region by either purchasing them or receiving them as donations. So far, this includes 42 parcels and over 800 acres of land. Among those are Gilberti's farm and the Fromson Strassler property in Weston, where we are creating a 705 acre forest block on the Weston Wilton border. Part two of the green corridor is land stewardship, encouraging homeowners to keep their backyards sustainable. We are controlling the plants that are on our land. And right now we, we vastly favor giant lawns. We've got 40 million acres of lawn in this country. That's the size of New England. Uh, and, and particularly the way we treat our lawns, that's, that's a deadscape. Our lawns don't provide food webs that support all the other things that we, we need. So what we wanna do is re-landscape our yards. I suggest we cut the area of lawn in half, put in the plants that support the food webs and the pollinators and create uh, what we, we call biological carters that connect the actual habitats so that the plants and animals in those habitats not only can move back and forth between habitats, uh, but they can actually live outside those habitats. Now, the Green Corridor Initiative from the Aspatuck Land Trust uh, is organizing an effort to create the biological corridors that, that we talked about. Of course, the corridor will be much more effective if everybody joins up. If you have holes in it, that's 
you know, that's an obstruction. And it, you know, it's not hard. Put that oak tree in your yard and, and instead of the ginkgo. And all of a sudden you've got connectivity with, with migrating birds and countless other species. We are in a critical moment in time to save our species and protect our natural lands. Insect populations have declined by 40% since the 1970s, and we've lost 3 billion birds since that time. And as population growth swells in America's suburbs, so does harmful development. Creating a greener planet starts with greener suburbs and greener backyards. Okay, great, everybody. Thank you for uh, taking the time to listen. I uh, love that video every time I see it. Uh, I learned something new and I'm just very proud of the work that we're doing here at the Land Trust to really take uh, um, Dr. Tallamy's teachings to the next level. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Um, Doug is currently the professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware in Newark. His primary research goal is to better understand the ways that insects interact with plants and how much interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and The Living Landscape that he co-wrote with Rick Dark, have been a, the driving force be, behind the nationwide movement to treat our private properties, our yards, in a more ecologically balanced way. His work has actively informed what we do at the Aspetuck Land Trust Green Corridor, as you saw in the video, and also the folks that are driving the Northeast Pollinator Pathway teams. As we take action steps in our own yards by planting natives, avoiding pesticides, and rethinking our lawns. Doug's newest book, The Nature of Oaks, will be the focus of his talk today as we better understand why this species is at the top of the list of powerhouse trees in our native landscape. So I am honored to welcome our guest and dear friend, Doug Tallamy. So Doug, take it away. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm screen sharing now, we're all set. Terrific, Doug, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm glad this is a, a brunch, and I hope you have something delicious to eat, because if you don't like this talk, you can enjoy your brunch. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the, the nature of oaks, that the, the natural things that are happening on the oaks in your yard, to try to give you more reasons to put oaks in your yard. But before I do that, I want to set a little background. What we're going to do is we're going to follow the life that is on the oaks in, in my yard uh, but this is what my yards looked like in 2000 when we moved in. Cindy and I moved into a, a farm that had been split up and sold in 10 acre lots and it had been mowed for hay. So this is this is what was here. Not not much. Uh, so one of the first things we wanted to do was to put some trees back. Um, we had spent all our money buying this property, so we wanted to do it cheaply. So. We simply got some seeds from trees down the, the street. One of them was a white oak. We planted it uh, and white oaks germinate in the fall. So in the fall, this is what you see, an acorn with a, it looks like a root. It's a radical that goes straight down. Uh, and that's all that happens in the fall. In the spring, they finally put up leaves and it's, it's a first set of leaves that sit there the entire summer. And this is probably where oaks get the, the, the reputation as very slow growers. But what they're doing that first year is laying down uh, a very healthy root system that will serve them well the rest of their lives. In fact, in their first year, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. So there's my little oak, uh, and that's probably year two, believe it or not, uh, with this little deer cage around it because the deer like, like my oats as much as my, my insects do. Uh, but 18 years later, this is, this is that oak. It's 45 feet tall circumference of 47 inches, the canopy spread is 30 feet. It is still a baby, but it's a real tree. Uh, it's a real tree that is supporting, uh, it's, it's a, a lifeline to, to really countless creatures. Uh, I cover many of them in, in the book, 
but um, not all of them for sure. We're talking about dozens of species of birds and rodents and bears. We don't have too many bears here right now, but we do have raccoons, possums, rat snakes, fence lizards, several butterflies. There are hundreds of species of moths that are using the oaks in our yard, plus their predators and their parasitoids. I don't know how many species of cynipid gall wasps we have. I should count them, but we have a lot of them. Lots of beetles using the oaks, um, spiders, and there are a dozen more species of, of arthropods and mollusks and annelids, annelids that are using the oak leaf litter. Uh, the problem is that, that that vast diverse web of life that's associated with oaks goes unnoticed uh, and therefore unappreciated by almost everybody. So that is the goal is to expose these things to, uh, to the general public so that they can appreciate the oaks that are in their yards or give them a reason to put oaks in their yards if there's not one there already. And that's why I wrote uh, the book, The Nature of Oaks. It's a month by month guide to the life on your oaks. First, a few facts. Uh, oaks are in the genus Quercus, which, a chain, which contains, it's actually 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So it's a big, big genus. Uh, Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So Quercus is a fine tree, and it is a fine tree indeed. Uh, there are four common sections uh, in the genus, taxonomic sections. Quercus is the white oak group. Lobati is the red oak group. Marentes is the live oak group. And then there's a small group in the West called the canyon oak group, the protobalanus. So the ones that we associate with up here in the Northeast are really the white oak group and the red oak group. They have a very long life cycle, much longer than people realize. Uh, 900 year life cycle. They can grow for 300 years, 300 years of stasis, and then 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of, of uh, the oak's life, it is contributing in different ways to the ecosystem around it. They can be enormous. Uh, this is the white oak in Y, Maryland. Uh, it's not there anymore. It, it fell down uh, oh, a while ago. I, I did get to visit it once before it fell down, but it was the biggest white oak in, in North America, just to give you an idea of the massive size that oaks can attain. But one of the things we'll point out later on is not all oaks are massive. We have some small ones and we want to take advantage of them. They have superior ecological function. Uh, they have the highest biodiversity value, and we'll talk about that quite a bit. But they're also sequestering more carbon dioxide than most other trees, or possibly all other trees. Very, very good. And that's excellent. We want to pull the carbon dioxide out of the air and tie it up in plant tissue and then pump it into the ground. That will help our climate change issues. Because they've got such big roots, root systems, they're stabilizing soil uh, better than most trees. Uh, their leaf litter is very long lasting, so it's contributing to the ground ecosystem longer than most other uh, types of leaf litter. That helps promote healthier watersheds along with those big root systems. So all of those things are valuable contributions to our yards. Okay, let's get started. We're going to start in October. And I start in October because that's when I decided to write this book. And I just looked outside and that's what my oak tree looked like. Um, we're going to follow this tree in particular. Um, although I've got many other oaks on, on my yard, most of which were started as, as acorns, which by the way are free. Although I did start a few as two foot bare root whips, which cost $1.50. Um, all right, in October, of course, that's when we are made aware of the fact that oaks make acorns. Uh, and sometimes they make a lot of acorns. A single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. It's a lot of propagules that, you know, an acorn is a, is a big seed compared to most other seeds. And there are lots of creatures that depend on those acorns. A lot of rodents do, those black bears we talked about. Um, turkeys love acorns. And then a lot of other birds, the, um, um, the red-bellied woodpecker, doesn't look like a red-bellied woodpecker, but it is. Uh, tough to tip mice, uh, towhees, believe it or not. White-breasted nuthatches, flickers, uh, squirrels, of course, we know love those, those acorns, and so do those, those very cute deer that are everywhere. But a lot of people don't know that ducks love acorns, particularly wood ducks. Uh, they'll spend a lot of time, any oak tree that's overhanging a, a body of water will drop the acorns into the water and the, the ducks then go diving for them. They eat a lot of acorns. Then there are a lot of uh, insects that eat acorns, particularly acorn weevils. Here's an acorn weevil popping out of a, uh, an acorn. 
Um, there's a, a group of moths called the Blastobasis moths that are acorn moths, and there's several species of them that are hitting acorns on a continuous basis. So when you have all those th things eating acorns and you look at the acorns under the tree at the end of the fall, this is what it looks like. They're either gone or destroyed. Uh, so you might wonder how do oaks ever actually reproduce with all those things that are eating those acorns. And this is where the blue jay comes in. Blue jay around here, but jays around the world have a, a very ancient mutualistic relationship with oaks. Um, they both evolved in Southeast Asia about 65 million years ago. So I'm talking about an ancient mutualism uh, and the oaks are giving jays food, just like all those other things, but the jays in return allow oaks to move. As a matter of fact, oaks can move faster than any other tree species in the world or any other tree genus. And by move, I mean disperse. And they do it because of the jays behavior. Jays store acorns for winter food. So they pick up an acorn. They don't cache them. Uh, in other words, put a whole bunch of, of acorns in the same place. They bury them singly in different places. So they pick one up, they'll fly up to a mile uh, from the parent tree. And that's farther than any of those other acorn eaters. Then they tap it below the surface of the ground. If they think another Jane ha jay has seen them bury uh, that acorn, they know what's going to happen. The jay will come and steal it. So they wait around for a few minutes and make sure uh, nobody's looking. If somebody did look, they will pick it up and move it to another, another spot. Um, so jays are smart. And then during the winter, of course, the idea is that they will remember where they put those acorns and then go uh, have something to eat in the wintertime. A single jay, particularly during an oak mast year, can bury 4,500 acorns. Uh, that's a lot for a single jay, but their memory is far from purpose, uh, uh, far from perfect. So they only recover one out of every four of those acorns, which means a single jay can plant 3,360 oak trees each year. And that's why those oaks can move so fast. Okay, November. Well, have you ever noticed that uh, some years we have a lot of acorns and other years we don't? And when we do have a lot, it's called an oak mast. So not this past fall, but two falls ago, we had a big oak mast in the red oak group from uh, I think Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia. They produced a lot of, of acorns. And then other years, like this past year, we had very few and who knows what's gonna happen next, next year. So it's extremely variable. And there've been a lot of people wondering why, why do oaks mass, why don't they produce a regular crop of acorns every single year? And there are actually four different hypotheses about why that is. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improves pollination when you mast and energy partitioning. So let's look briefly at each one of those. Predator satiation, this is the acorn weevil larva uh, and they can be really numerous. Uh, when you have uh, a good production of, of acorns and a good production of acorn weevils, they can hit over 90% of the, the acorns. So if the acorn production was extremely constant every year, the predator low, we'll call these, they're eating, you know, you might say they're herbivores, but they're eating acorns, so they're acorn predators. Um, their population can stabilize at the level of acorns that are produced, which means almost all the acorns will be eaten by acorn weevils every single year. And that's not going to help the oak very much. Um, so if you produce them variably, then the acorn weevils can't track them. And there'll be some years where you have a whole lot of acorns and not enough acorn weevils, and those, those uh, acorns will make it through. Predator reduction is uh, similar, but a little bit different. Squirrels, for example, uh, when you have an oak mast, squirrels and, and mice in particular, can their populations can respond very quickly. So they, they explode. You have a lot of squirrels and a lot of mice, depending on those acorns that were produced that year. But the following year, if there are not very many acorns, those populations crash. Uh, and there's actually a lot of starvation. But that means the year after that, there won't be so many predators that if the oaks make a lot of acorns, um, they'll all get eaten. That's called predator reduction. Improve pollination. Uh, oaks are wind pollinated. So uh, the, the thought is that 
when all the oaks are releasing pollen at the same time, uh, wind pollination is just much more effective. You know, it, it, it depends on the vagaries of the wind. So uh, when everybody's releasing a lot of pollen, and that of course is why oaks make some people sneeze, and we apologize for that, it's only for a week or two. Uh, but the, the uh, effective pollination of the female flowers, um, it'll be much more effective when you have an oak mast. And then finally, energy allocation. Uh, there's rarely enough energy around in the natural world. So with oaks, you can put that energy towards growth or you can put it toward producing acorns, towards reproduction. But rarely do you have enough energy to do a lot of both. So they, they allocate one year to uh, growth or maybe several years to growth and then one massive year to acorn production. Uh, so that's just simply allocating uh, what's in a limited supply because they can't do everything at once. Let me let me stress that each one of those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all can be happening at the same time. On to December. Now, have you noticed that many oaks, particularly in the white oak group, do not drop their leaves during the winter time. They hang on to their leaves. Um, younger trees hang on to their leaves more than older trees. And when they hang on to their leaves, it's typically the lower branches and not the upper branches. That is called, uh, it's a condition called marcescence, uh, where a deciduous tree is not dropping its leaves. Uh, it's not very common, but it happens uh, a lot in oaks. It also happens in beeches, which are in the same family of, as oaks. And then it scatters through a few other groups of trees, even trees in the tropics. So uh, there, again, there are a number of hypotheses about why marcissus e exists, but the leading one has to do with those large Pleistocene mammals that were around not that long ago, eight, 9,000 years ago. Uh, this is what was roaming Mexico, believe it or not. There were three species of mastodon. There was the giant sloth, camels. I mean, here's the size of an elk. So these were, these were big guys. Uh, and many of these, I mean, here's some predators over here, but these guys are all herbivores. They were browsers, meaning they're eating uh, the tips, the, the uh, buds of woody plants. And if the leaves uh, are, are um, retained around those buds that will, you know, bring forth growth next year, it makes those buds very distasteful. So it's a way of protecting the vulnerable tissues to those herbivores. Uh, that would be munching all, all winter long. Uh, and that would explain why you have leaves on the lower parts of the tree and not the upper parts of the tree. The leaves go up pretty consistently about 18 feet, which is just about the reach of that giant sloth and easily the reach of those, those uh, mammoths. Uh, and then beyond that, nobody, they, they can't get up that high. So uh, why bother with the leaves? It's a pretty convincing story about why the leaves are around there. A related hypothesis is that it would be difficult to eat those leaves, those buds without making a sound, you know, dry oak leaves make a rustling sound, which means it would be difficult to eat an oak tree without telling your predators that you're there. And back in those days, there were a lot of predators. So uh, it would be another reason to, to uh, not include oaks in your diet. Uh, the fact that uh, many of our young oaks uh, do retain leaves, this marcescent condition, actually allows oaks to be good screens in the middle of winter, even though they're a deciduous tree. You can't see through that and you could use that in, in landscape designs. January, it's cold in January and actually this, this January, it, it really was. Um, and not, not many people are out walking around, but if you are and you're staring up at those bare, bare limbs where you might think nothing is happening, um, occasionally you'll see bird activity. And this is one that I see quite quite often, the golden crown kinglet, but there's also chickadees and, and tip mice up there. And if you watch what they're doing, it looks like they're hopping from branch to branch foraging. But of course the branches are bare, there's no leaves up there. Uh, even though I'm an entomologist, I got to my ripe old age thinking, there are no insects up there either, it's the middle of winter. Uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, those golden crown kinglets and, and chickadees. These are resident birds, tip mice, that are spending most of the winter uh, foraging up in the tree. You know, a lot of people think that, that uh, chickadees and tip mice are eating seeds at our feeders because they are, but only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% turns out to be insects. And the kinglets 
the golden crown kinglet is entirely uh, insectivorous. It's a tiny little bird that should be a migrant, but it's not. Well, Bern Heinrich, who uh, he, he's a professor emeritus at this point, but he writes the natural history column in the magazine Natural History. Uh, years ago, he was wondering, what the heck are these things eating? Uh, and he dissected a whole bunch of kinglets, and he found that their crops were full of caterpillars in Maine in January, which means they're getting caterpillars in Maine in January. Big surprise. Uh, Burns, Burns a, an entomologist as well. But they're the caterpillars. They're sitting on the branches right through the winter, uh, looking like branches, so it's very easy to miss them. They're not eating. There's nothing there to eat. They're simply spending the winter in the caterpillar stage. <laughs> That's one right there. And these birds know that, and they're, they're um, searching the branches very carefully to find those, those caterpillars. How do they spend the winter, uh, or how do they get through those, those uh, very cold periods? Well, they have antifreeze proteins in their bodies that keep their cells from bursting when the temperatures drop below freezing. So it's the very same principle that the antifreeze in our car, uh, cars work by. Um, and you might wonder, why don't they do what other insects do, where they either overwinter as an egg or as a pupa and occasionally as an adult. But overwintering as a, as a uh, you know, partially or even full grown caterpillar seems, doesn't seem like a great strategy. And the advantage, uh, again, we're just guessing here, but the advantage would be that when those leaves uh, burst out, these caterpillars are ready to go. Uh, so they can take advantage of new foliage faster than any, any of these other life stages if they spend the winter just ready to eat. So that's what's happening soon. And those caterpillars will be ready. They'll be, they'll be um, the first to take advantage of this great big flush of nutrients. OK, February, this is the quietest time of year in terms of, of oaks. Uh, by this time, a lot of those caterpillars have been picked off. So there's there's uh, there's fewer, there's less uh, bird foraging activity. The acorns are gone. So this would be a good time to talk about some of the oak landscaping myths. Uh, and there's a lot of them surrounding the use of, of oaks. They're all negative for some reason. Uh, and one of them is oaks are too expensive. We can't. You know, we can't afford to use oaks. They grow too slowly. We won't live long enough to enjoy them. Uh, they're too big to use in, in typical small lots. Uh, and if you do use them, they'll fall and crush, crush our houses or they'll lift up our sidewalk. I mean, they, they sound like great reasons to avoid putting oaks in our landscapes. Let's talk about each one and see whether, whether they are accurate or not. Okay, oaks are too expensive. Well, they are if you insist on spending a lot of money. In other words, if you insist on instant gratification and try to buy a really big oak, and by really big oak, I mean, you know, 12, 15 feet, um, and that's the way they're sold in a lot of, a lot of cases. They're grown in pots or they're grown or they're, they're uh, you know, bald and burlap, but they're sold as large trees because everybody wants instant gratification. Um, that's a big mistake, folks. Not only are you going to spend a lot of money, and I mean a lot of money, a lot of these oaks will, will go for $3,000. Uh, but look what happens when you, when you take the soil away from these trees that are grown in pots like that for a long time. Oaks have huge root systems, and they just go around and around and around. This is called classic root-bound situation. And if the tree doesn't die shortly after you plant it, uh, the roots will continue to grow, and they will strangle each other, and it will die later on. Um, so you want to avoid buying anything that's going to be root bound. And these roots are too big to simply chop up the way you would with a, uh, a finer rooted plant. Bird, bird bald and burlap uh, trees uh, don't typically have the root bound problem, but, but in order to uh, plant them this way, they have to be root pruned. So the majority of their roots are chopped off. And then you have a large tree with a very small root system, which makes them uh, very um, prone to any kind of a drought situation. Uh, but also, the first thing they do after you plant them for the next decade is try to rebuild that root system. So they won't grow uh, very much at all. They'll simply sit there. They, they have a 50% die uh, chance of dying because of, of that all that root pruning. So you're spending a lot of money to have a tree that will not be nearly as healthy as if you had planted a very small tree like that. That is the way you should be buying your, your oaks or even, as I said, as an, as an acorn. And of course, nurseries don't want to sell them that way because they can't charge you a lot of money. But this tree will grow faster uh, than those large trees and, and um, beat them over time 
much faster than you would actually think. And I've done that in, in my own property, planting acorns and 15 foot trees at the, on the same day. The acorns have surpassed those trees uh, and are much, much healthier. How fast do oaks really grow? I mean, they do have this, this uh, reputation of growing very slowly because of, of our need to have instant gratification. If you do plant that acorn the first couple of years, they just, it seems like they just sit there and people get very impatient. Well, let's have a race here between my little friend Bella uh, and the oak tree that I planted as an acorn in our, our yard. Um, so here it is, the acorn or the tree is now six years old. Bella is two years old. And we're gonna see whether she can catch up to this, this very slow growing tree. So she's, she's uh, the oak is six years old here. Here it is seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Bella's losing, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And here's Bella in 2020 with her mask on. Uh, she's definitely lost that, that race. Uh, my oak has beaten her handily. So this is a white oak. That's got the reputation of growing extremely slowly, but look how fast they do grow when you allow that root system to develop. I'm sorry, Bella, you're, you're a loser here. You don't have to wait very long for your oaks to contribute ecologically though. And this is, this is a really important point. Remember, our oaks are more than just decorations in our yard. They're contributing to uh, the food web in particular in our yard and they will do it that very first year. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating that, that pin oak. So again, you don't have to wait centuries for your oak to become a vibrant member of your, your little ecosystem. Um, are oaks too big to, to use in small yards? Well, you know, this is, this is a judgment call, but uh, I can drive around and find big oaks. These are two big red oaks uh, in a very small yard here, right in Newark, Delaware. Um, they're there. I'm pretty sure they were planted when that house was built, which was well over 100 years ago. Um, they haven't fallen down. They haven't crushed it. Can I guarantee they never will? No, of course not. But in the meantime, they are reducing the temperature. Uh, by 10 degrees of this house in the summertime. They're protecting it in the wintertime. Um, so it's not out of the question that you can, they can have large trees in very small lots. It's a very large oak in uh, the front yard of a very large church, actually. It dwarfs the church, uh, and they were wise enough to keep it. Uh, but the important thing is that all oaks are not gigantic. Uh, we have all of these are either ground cover, uh, shrub, shrubs or small trees. A lot more in the west, but here are options in the east. This one's already in the trade, dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. Um, I'd love to get the rest of these guys in, in the trade. Uh, there are a number of options. Some of these actually are, are uh, almost endangered, so it'd be great to um, get these guys in the trade and, and boost up their populations. But you can put small oaks in small yards without having to worry about those other issues. This is uh, the dwarf chestnut oak. It produces acorns when it's about five feet tall. So it doesn't get very big. Quercus prinoides. Will oaks crush your houses? You know, when we listen to the news or, or we watch, watch the news after a storm, it certainly seems like every tree that's out there is gonna fall in our house or our car, um, sometimes with disastrous results. Uh, so we know it does happen, but the way we plant our trees encourages that. Uh, we typically plant them as specimen trees because we want each one of them to reach its full, full grandeur without any competition from any other tree. So when they're specimen trees, their root system is not locked in with any other root system. And particularly when you get a very rainer period followed by high winds, it's easy to lift up those trees and they fall over. This is the way trees actually want to grow. They grow in uh, much closer uh, spacing to each other and their root system is locked in with each other. They do not fall over then. Um, they may, may snap off in a tornado and there's nothing you can do to present, prevent yourself from damage in a tornado, but they won't fall over. And this is the way uh, trees and uh, uh, root systems interlock in the wild. If you can go to a stream cut and look at, look at how those roots are, are uh, interlocking. One, two, three, four trees here you're not gonna uh, blow those over, believe me, they are locked in with each other. 
So rather than this, go for that specimen tree. Um, think about planting your oaks closer together the way you would find in a more natural situation. What you're going to create is an oak grove. And it doesn't have to be oaks. Any, any tree, make them tree groves, two at least, but maybe even three, maybe even four. These trees are, they obviously were here when they put the road in, but they're on, I don't know, it's about a seven foot center. Um, neither one of them is as big as it would have been if it had been alone, but they are safe and sound locked in together. Uh, this is called the Three Sisters in Northwest Connecticut. Uh, again, locked in together. So you're viewing them as a unit. Uh, and this is a great example. This is Mount Cuba Center in, in Hocassin, Delaware. It's a, a DuPont estate that um, was dedicated to native plants starting way back in the 30s. So this is a planned planting here. Here's a big red oak back here. These are hemlocks, uh, rhododendrons and other things. It's, a, it's a, uh, a planned landscape that creates that very stable grove situation. It looks totally natural. Um, and none of those trees are functioning as specimen trees, but they're functioning as an aesthetically pleasing unit. And that's the way we need to start thinking about planting our trees. Will the oaks lift up your sidewalks? Uh, well, some oaks will. The willow oak, for example, typically has very shallow root systems. Uh, I would not put that next to uh, a road or a sidewalk, but um, particularly members of the, the red oak group, pin oaks and, and red oaks, um, scarlet oaks, black oaks, they have much deeper root systems. And I'll just show you a bunch of examples here. There's two big red oaks, uh, nothing's being lifted up. I mean, look at that, those, those roots are going down. So you can plant an oak without destroying your hardscape. All right, on to March. The leaves are finally dropping at this point. The marcescence is, is giving up. Um, actually, I, looking at my oak right out the, the window now, um, it still has some leaves, but very shortly they all, all would be down. Um, so let's talk about leaf litter now that they're on the ground. Um, you know, there are more species of, of uh, animals in the soil than above the soil uh, when you have healthy soil. Uh, and the only reason they can live there is if the soil conditions are correct. And that means high humidity, a lot of moisture. Um, and that means you need to have that, that blanket of leaves protecting them. Bare ground destroys the soil community because the soil erodes and it dries out very, very quickly. So here's an example of what you can find in one square meter of healthy forest soil. 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails. This is a smithward springtail, um, which were really common last fall for some reason. I guess we had a lot of rain. 90,000 proturans, which you've probably never seen at all. They're primitive insects that are very small. You see them uh, much more easily with a microscope. And a million nematodes. That's a lot of life forms in a single meter. If you have healthy soil. There are also 70 species of moths that are easily seen. They're called litter moths um, that eat dead leaves. Like the ambiguous litter moth, very common at my house, or the dark spotted palthus. Again, excuse me, eating, eating uh, green leaves. So when we, you know, when we chop up those leaves, we're chopping up a lot of things that uh, are living in those leaves. Then there, of course, all the, the predators that are living off those things I just described. Ground beetles, very, very common in our leaf litter. Lots of spiders, very common. So uh, protecting your leaf litter. I like to think of leaf litter the way uh, water managers now think of, of water. We want to, when it rains, you want to keep all the water that falls on your property on your property so it percolates into the soil. Um, let's think the same way with leaves. All the leaves that fall on your, your property need to stay on your property because you're going to recycle the nutrients from those leaves. You never have to fertilize your, your uh, trees. Uh, all the, the nutrients those trees need are locked up in the leaves. And if they degrade on your property, then that, that those nutrients can be returned to the tree and everything will be great. Okay, on to April. 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 That is when you get a real bud break. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's actually an exciting time of, of the year because life is jumping forth. And it is your chance to watch one of the most ephemeral interactions that occur in all of nature. It's something that lasts only about five minutes, five minutes a year. And it took me years to actually find that right five minutes and, and see it. I was just plain lucky. But I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps actually lay their eggs in oak buds. Uh, and this is what you're seeing here. This is a 
female uh, right here. She's being ridden by a male so that as soon as she finishes laying one egg, he'll mate with her so he can be the father of the next egg. Here's a hopeful male. Um, I think he's going to lose out, but if this guy gets tired, he's, he's there. Along with that egg, the female is injecting the meristematic tissues on the yolk. So buds are filled with undifferentiated cells that can then turn into uh, pretty much anything. Think of them as stem cells. And the female sinipid is manipulating them with hormones, plant hormones that she's injecting into the, the uh, oak bud. And they will grow into, people describe it as a cancerous growth, um, but it, it's a gall. Cancer sounds, sounds so one-sided that the sinipid is really manipulating the, the oak entirely in its favor. But think of it as an interaction between the, the gall wasp and the oak itself. The oak is also manipulating the gall wasp, keeping its, uh, its damage to one single place, as opposed to having the gall wasp tunnel up and down the, the stem. There are a lot of species of gall wasps, about 5,000 species of sinipid gallers worldwide. A single oak species can support 70 different species of, of gallers. And the, gall, the variation in galls uh, is, is fantastic. Most galls are nearly hollow, believe it or not. This is the apple oak gall. If you cut it open, that's where the galler is, right there in, in the very center of the gall. Most of the gall is absolutely hollow with these little rays in there, and this is the external part of the gall. Why is that? Well, gallers, sinipid gall wasps, have more parasitoids, more species of parasitoids that attack them than any other type of insect. And this is what one of them looks like. This is a pterymid wasp, and that's its ovipositor. So what has to happen is the distance between where the galler is and the external part of the gall has to be greater than the length of the ovipositor. Come back here. Um, of the species of, of, of uh, parasitoid that is trying to get that, that galler. Uh, the parasitoids succeed, but only in a very narrow window before the gall has expanded enough to separate the galler from the uh, width of the length of the ovipositor. If you bring a gall inside, uh, particularly this time of year, and, and uh, rear it out, just put it in a jar and see what emerges, most of the time you're going to get not sinipid gall, gallers, but the parasitoids of those gallers. By the way, but, but the, you might wonder why we use the word parasitoid instead of parasite. There's a good reason. Parasites don't kill their hosts. So think of a, a, you know, a body louse or something that feed on you, but they don't kill you. A parasitoid always kills its host. It only kills one host. One host is enough for the parasitoid to complete its development. So these are, these are like predators, but they only have one host. A predator actually has a number of different hosts. Again, a lot of uh, variety in, in uh, gall morphology. Um, so I'll just show you a few pictures. These are oak bullet galls. Some of them look like diseases, but they're really different types of sinipids. Some of them look like pottery. Um, this is a mature oak, oak bullet gall. Some of them look like brains. Tremendous amount of variation. And then then uh, midsummer, um, there's a second flush of gall leaves, typically early July. And that's when that first burst of, of gallers emerges and uh, has a second generation. And what's really complicated about gallers is that the first generation produces galls that look like a, a, a you know, particular type of gall and the galler has a particular morphology. The second generation, the gall is entirely different and the gall wasp looks entirely different, just like a different species. And I still am amazed that the early taxonomists were able to figure out that they were really talking about the same species here, making two different types of galls at different times of the year. Um, April is also the best time to find uh, polyphemus cocoons that might have been on your, your oak. This is a polyphemus uh, caterpillar. These are one of the giant silk moths, of course, and they eat the leaves, but then they spin a cocoon that hangs from one of the branches, and that stays there all winter long. But when you've got those marcescent leaves around the, the tip, you often can't see it. But after those leaves drop, you can find these, these uh, silvery cocoons and know just how many polyphemus moths you have. It's usually not going to be a lot because these are, these are increasingly rare. And then you get the adult coming out and they do it all over again. But it's one of the, one of the uh, neater insects that is using the oaks in your yard. 
May, this is when the biological year really gets going in earnest um, because those leaves are, are they, they com complete their full expansion during May. And when you have this flush of new growth, uh, that's happening in, in May. They go from this in the beginning of May all the way to fully expanded leaves by the end of the May. Close on the, on the heels of the expansion of those leaves, of course, is the flush of the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following that flush is the spring migration of birds that eat those caterpillars. It's not a coincidence that birds decide to move north uh, when we have that great flush of caterpillars, because that is what's fueling their migration. And once they get where they're going, it's what's fueling their, uh, their reproduction. And birders know this. Birders know that uh, warblers in particular love to forage on oaks during the migration. So when you see uh, birders in a group looking up in the sky, they're almost always looking at an oak. Uh, one of my former students, Christy Beal, quantified the amount of time that warblers spent foraging on trees in different families. This is the Fagaceae where the oaks are. Uh, so there's oaks and beeches and chestnuts, but in her study, they were all oaks. There were no beeches and chestnuts. Uh, so look, they spent much more time foraging on oaks than on any of the other tree families. She did all this work in, in uh, cemeteries. So there's a, there's, a, there's a reason that the birds are there and that's because that's where the food is. Birds, there's no point in foraging on, on trees that uh, make no food at all. That makes as much sense as it would if, if you went shopping in, in uh, an Acme where all the shelves were bare. You wouldn't do that very often. Why are they there? Because again, that's where the caterpillars are. Lots of types of caterpillars. What was, what was that last one? That's the purple crested slug caterpillar. This is the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, the double line prominent, the white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the uh, white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the hickory tussock moth, the red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, the pink striped oak worm, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and my favorite the spun glass slug. They're called slug caterpillars because the head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really, really slug. And it really does look like spun glass. And, and literally hundreds more. I've been taking pictures of the um, caterpillars in my yard just to document the size of that very important part of the food web that has colonized our our property because we have put the plants there. And I'm up to 1,036 species of moths in my yard. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. 30% of them are using my, my oaks. And that's because oaks are what I call keystone species. What's a keystone species? Remember the Roman arch. The keystone was the stone in the middle. And if you take the stone out of the middle, the arch collapses. Well, if you take the, the keystone plants out of the food web, the food web collapses. And that's because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our, our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% <clears throat> of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. Uh, and the top keystone plant in 84% of the counties in North America uh, is the genus Quercus, oaks. In the mid-Atlantic state, they support 557 species of caterpillars, and that includes Connecticut, by the way. Uh, over 900 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. <clears throat> so if you, if you want to pick a single plant that's going to contribute the most to the diversity in your yard, it's got to be an oak. Okay, on to June, cicada month. It's cicada month this year anyway. Um, we're talking about the emergence of the periodical cicadas, both the 17-year brood and the 13-year uh, brood are options. At my house, it's going to be the 17-year brood. I don't know if you're going to have a cicada emergence or not up, up in Connecticut, um, but I've been looking forward to this for 17 years. And of course, if you 
you know, if you if you listen to the news media, they want to sensationalize it, and they're always going to sensationalize it in a terrible way. Um, that it's a scourge. It's going to be so loud you'll go deaf. Uh, they're going to kill all your trees, and it's just terrible. And it's none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events that you're ever going to uh, have have the privilege of of witnessing. And I'm excited about it because it may be the last one I, I witness. Uh, you know, it's going to be 17 more years before another one comes out. I'm also curious to see what has happened on our property since the last one. My trees were really small when the last one came out. So, um, uh, you know, who knows what it's going to look like. They can be really numerous. A Under good conditions, which are harder to come by these days, there can be 20,000 cicada nymphs on a single oak tree uh, feeding on the xylem on the roots and that's pro and they and they can be there without any visible damage to the tree maybe it, it slows its growth a little bit but it's extremely hard to measure and that's because xylem is mostly water there's very few nutrients in it and it's one of the reasons it might take them 17 years to complete their development is that the the nutritional value of what they're eating is is so low but uh they they are synchronized after 17 years they will all come out in a you know what one or two nights um, extremely synchronized uh, and and then this is again it's a uh, an example of predator satiation there are a lot of things that like to eat cicadas and if cicadas came out uh, in smaller numbers every single year the, these populations would build to the point where they would wipe them out every single year but if they come out uh, over long after long periods of, of being underground um, chipmunk or squirrel populations or bird populations could not uh, be sustained in between those long periods. So there would never be enough to eat them all. Predator satiation, there'll be cicadas uh, that, that are not eaten and that will continue the population. So uh, will they kill all your plants? No, but they do lay their eggs in the terminal parts of branches uh, they insert the eggs into the stem and it can kill the stem causing from that point on causing what we call flagging and um, this would be a good year not to plant a young tree <clears throat> in the spring I would plant it in the fall it's easy to to dodge that emergent because if it's a very young tree they can they can knock it back so wait to the fall uh, but otherwise, it, they're just nature's pruners and everything else will do just fine. The eggs hatch, by the way, and the little guys parachute down to the ground, tunnel underneath the ground, and then feed on the, the uh, oak roots that are underground. Um, June is also when you might see the, uh, the banded hair streak. It's one of the hair streaks that develops on oaks. Uh, it's curious, you know, we've got hundreds of species of moths that develop on oaks, but very few species of butterflies. Uh, oaks protect themselves with tannins and lignans, and apparently that is a defense that butterflies never got real good at getting around. Uh, but this is one, the, the ones that are on, on oaks are hair streaks, and the banded hair streak is the uh, one that's common in our area. Don't look for the caterpillars on the leaves, because you're not going to find them. They're eating dead oak leaves. It's another reason not to throw out all your leaves, because you'll throw out all your banded hair streaks if you do that. Um, and it's impossible to find them there. I've never found a banded hair streak uh, caterpillar. But uh, since we're talking about hair streaks, let's talk about the most interesting thing about them. And that is that they have uh, what looks like a false head uh, on the backside of their, their wings. Um, so these look like antennae. And the way they, they move their wings up and down like this, it, the antennae are going up and down just as if they were uh, real antennae. Here are the real antennae at this end. Uh, I don't know what these are, two sets of antennae, maybe to make it twice as uh, convincing. And these spots are supposed to look like eye spots. Maybe this is the eye spot down here. The reason uh, that is, is to direct predator attacks toward a non-vital part of the body. Predators always like to go for the head to make a kill very quickly. Certainly true with birds. Uh, and the, the, the feeling always was that hair streaks are trying to avoid bird predation by, by directing the attack to the, to the back of the wing. And you can see hair streaks with the wing torn out uh, in the back there. So it really suggested that birds were the selective force for this type of coloration. But hair streaks are small, and it never made a lot of sense to me or a lot of other people. Um, and, and when a bird really attracts a hair streak, they fly straight into the sun. So the bird loses it right away because they can't, they can't see when they're flying into the sun. 
So it seemed like a lot of selective pressure that, that um, I don't know, just didn't make sense to me. Well, it didn't make sense to Andrei Sorkov either. And he figured out it had nothing to do with bird predation. It's all about Salticid jumping spider predation. Those, those uh, hair streaks spend most of the time sitting on vegetation, just moving their wings up and down. And that's, of course, exactly where those Salticid jumping spiders hunt. They've got a lot of eyes and they're very, very good at seeing their prey and jumping from seven, eight, nine, ten inches away, landing straight on it. But just like birds, they will aim their, their predation towards the hind wings mistakenly, they think they're going for the head, uh, and it can rip apart the back part of the hind wing and the butterfly can escape. So not birds, jumping spiders. July, this is when the night chorus begins. If you're in a healthy ecosystem, and we're still working on it at my house. Um, I'm talking about uh, Katie Dids, the arrival of Katie Dids. You know, once upon a time, there was a young woman named it says Doug Tellamy. That doesn't make sense. I don't know. Oh, named. I don't know what she was named, but she fell in love with, with a handsome young man. Alas, she, he did not share her feelings. Oh, yeah. Her name was Katie. OK, she, she fell in love with a handsome young man. He didn't share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated this crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. Oh no, you're supposed to be hearing Katie did sounds. I'm not hearing anything. I hope you're hearing Katie did sounds, but they go if you're not hearing it, I'll have to fix that. Do I have to go like this? Eh, all right, we're working on this. There are four species of katydids that frequent oak forests, um, and they can be quite numerous. Um, I used to do a lot of, of uh, camping as, as a, uh, well, our whole family did as a young boy, and those katydids singing us to sleep during the summer was, was all part of it. It brings back lots of fond, fond memories. This is an immature Katie did. It's uh, the fifth inch star ready to turn into an adult. It's already got its ovipositor way to go, ready to go. That's a spatula shape ovipositor. Here's, here it is as an, uh, an adult. Um, <clears throat> why are they so loud when they're singing? Well, it's the male who is singing. And of course, he's trying to attract females. And females judge males. Uh, based on how loud they are. What they're looking for are the best genes to put in their eggs so that their offspring can, can make it. So they discriminate among males who may be smaller or weaker by going for the loudest male because uh, sound uh, volume is correlated with male size. And if the males uh, attained large size, they must be very successful. This is what Katie did eggs look like. Um, They've already hatched here, but they're big flat things that are glued onto the, the edges of, of sticks. And if you ever see them and wonder what they are, those are Katie did eggs. And they will sing, those Katie dids will sing um, starting mid July all the way through August and a few will even hang on into September. All right, now we are in August. Uh, this is when oak leaves become really, really tough. Oak leaves are always pretty tough compared to many other other um, types of trees, but by August, they can be like bike boards. Uh, so curiously, it's also the time when you have the most caterpillars on, on oak trees. One of the reasons you have fewer caterpillars in the spring is because the birds have eaten them all. Uh, but in August, uh, there are a couple of ways that caterpillars can get around those very tough leaves. And one is by chewing them together. It's called gregarious feeding. This is the yellow neck caterpillar. And it's a very common technique for overcoming leaf toughness in the end of the summer. This is what they look like in older instars, but they're always eating together. A lot of mouths can get through that tough material easier than simply one mouth. Uh, so this is the yellow neck caterpillar. This is the uh, uh, orange humped oak worm. The red humped oak worm does the same thing. The pink striped oak worm does the same thing. The, the, um, all the oak worms do the same thing. Um, so that's an effective defense. Uh, and, you know, people say, well, they see them eating all that stuff and they get upset. But, you know, there are 111 or 115 yellow neck caterpillars just on the lower branches of this tree. 
Uh, can you see any of them? No, of course not. Can you see any of their damage? No, of course not. So let your caterpillars go. It's providing a lot of, of nutrients for your, your food web, and it's not going to destroy, destroy the aesthetic value of your tree. There's a woman in, in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, who suggests that we all practice the 10-step program when it comes to dealing with insects on our trees. We should take 10 steps back from our trees and all those insect problems disappear. And that's the distance that we view our, our trees. And I think it's a great recommendation. Don't get out the spray can. Your oak is designed to pass on its, its nutrients that way. Second way that, that insects avoid tough leaves on oak trees is to mine the leaves. The toughness is in the, the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis and the, the mesophyll, the parenchymal cells in the middle um, are still nutritious and very soft. So uh, there's been a lot of selection pressure to get really small and only eat the area inside there. And that's what leaf miners are doing. This is a serpentine leaf miner. The egg was laid here and it's called the serpentine because the mine ends up looking like a snake. This black line in the middle here is the frass that was created by the uh, larva, then it pupates here and then drops out of the tree. This is a blotch mine with the same thing happening. Um, that's what the larva looks like uh, if you are lucky enough to find it before it, it exits the tree. And here's a great photograph of uh, what a typical oak leaf miner looks like. Not really like a caterpillar at all. They don't need uh, legs for crawling around, but they do need to be really, really thin. But when they come out as a, an adult, they look like moths. They're small, but they look like moths. This is the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. There are a lot of, of miners on oaks to get around those very tough leaves. August is also a very dangerous time for oak caterpillars because the predator populations have built to their highest levels. Here's a eumenid wasp that has just stung a yellow striped oak worm. Um, so it's stiff as a board now, but it's very much alive. Uh, so this, this method of predation where they, they sting and paralyze a, a caterpillar and then fly off to their nest, they lay an egg on it, then their larva will hatch and eat the caterpillar alive. Is that's uh, nature's um, invention uh, that replaces or, or functions just the way our refrigerators do. If they killed the caterpillar and then laid an egg on it, it would rot way before the egg even hatched. So this way they stay nice and fresh, kind of gruesome, but that's, that's the mechanism for keeping them fresh. Keep them alive, but paralyze them. Um, even eggs are subject to an awful lot of, of uh, um, mortality from natural enemies. This is a batch of yellow net caterpillar eggs. They were just laid, but within minutes, a parasitoid tiny little wasp shows up and starts to lay eggs inside those eggs. And this is what happens when they, they emerge. Um, a lot of those eggs are hit by those parasitoids and it really knocks down the numbers of those, uh, of those caterpillars. Jacinid flies, very common. This is an entire family of flies that are parasitoids. Uh, and well, they parasitize lots of types of insects, but many of them are, are caterpillars. And many of them are caterpillars on oaks. As a matter of fact, when you collect a caterpillar later in the season, it is very difficult to raise it through to maturity because it's probably been parasitized. This is a, a, spine, a, a saddleback caterpillar. You may uh, recognize it if you've ever bumped into one. They have what we call urticating hairs. There's a little poison sac at the base of each one of these spines. And if it breaks off in you, it hurts. Uh, but it, it doesn't kill you. But this guy's uh, the walking dead. He's got a tachinid egg here that is going to hatch and burrow into him. He's got a teramelid wasp here that is actively laying eggs in him. And this is a tachinid larva that's already inside. This is the, the spiracles, um, the breathing apparatus kind of like a snorkel that's popped up through his, his skin. So there's no way it's gonna reach adulthood. Uh, very high uh, mortality pressure on caterpillars at the end of the season. Here's a contracted daytana that has four tachinid eggs on its head. This guy is already hatched and burrow in. These three are going to, so he's another caterpillar that's essentially dead. Um, some caterpillars are taking advantage of, of the fact that tachinids are so common. Uh, and that is they make a permanent pattern on their back that looks like tachinid eggs. This is the black blotch caesura, and a tachinid will come along and see those uh, and say, well, gee, there's already eggs here. I'm not going to bother laying my eggs on them, even though that's his normal coloration. So 
kind of turn the tables on the tachinids. One of the ways that uh, caterpillars protect themselves from all of these parasitoids is whenever they feel a little vibration on their leaf, they will tumble off the leaf and suspend themselves on a thread and hang there until the parasitoid gets tired and goes away. Uh, very common, you can walk around and see things hanging from trees from their leaves all the time, particularly at night, by the way. Uh, but there are some uh, Braconid wasps that have figured out how to deal with that. They will actually lean over the leaf and pull up the, the thread of the caterpillar hand over hand, um, just like a rope, and then lay an egg in the caterpillar when it gets to the top. Or they will shinny down, the, another species will shinny down that, that uh, line and parasitize the caterpillar as he's hanging there. So tough life for caterpillars on, on oaks. Uh, it's also the end of the summer is also the time that you will find the biggest populations of flatteds and acanalinides. These are these are um, plant hoppers that can get really numerous. This is an acanalinid on oaks, and I get calls. Oh, what's what's eating my oaks? And they look so ugly. Um, this is the nymph, uh, and it's got flocculent wax coming at its rear end. That's a protective device to keep ants from from eating it. It does look like a strange creature. Uh, but um, appreciate its strangeness. They can be really common and numerous. They're sucking uh, phloem from the trees. And again, they can be common, but they're not going to kill anything. Just appreciate them as part of the fauna that's on your, your plants. September, our last month. Uh, this is the, the peak of cricket populations uh, in, in uh, the fall and also on our oaks. Now we think of crickets typically as the, the black insects on the ground singing away, and many of them are, but there's a whole group of crickets called tree or bush crickets that are green or brown and they're up in the vegetation. And September is the time that you, of year that you can uh, witness uh, a really interesting behavior. The males are just like the katydids. They wanna attract the females and they do it by singing. Uh, and uh, again, the females will go to the male that is making the loudest sound. So these guys have figured out how to cheat. They find a hole in the leaf and they stick their head through it and then they sing into that hole and it forms a, a parabolic amplification of the sound and projects it out. Um, particularly if the leaf is, is uh, a convex when it's doing that. And some species actually chew a hole to the right specifications and they'll sing within it. Uh, I took this picture right, right in my yard so you can, you can uh, see this. This happens at night, of course. You have to go out at night with your flashlight to see it. Then the female picks the, uh, again, the loudest sound, but it could be loud just because this male was really good at finding a good hole in the leaf. Uh, it's the time of year that you're most likely to see walking sticks. Walking sticks can be pretty common in oak forests. Um, they're always up in the canopy though, so, so they're, they're rarely encountered. But in the fall, uh, they get tired, I guess, and, and they start to come down. This is one I took in Arizona on an emery oak. Uh, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks that walk. Okay, we've made it through the year. Uh, let me just wind up with... Um, to emphasize what you already know. You know, we, we have a biodiversity crisis on this planet. Uh, we, we are killing our birds. We've lost three billions of them. Mill tell you that in the beginning. We're killing our insects. We've got global insect decline. We're now in the middle of the sixth great extinction event. I don't like it when people say things are disappearing. They're not disappearing like magic. We're killing them. That's why they're gone. So we know exactly what the problem is. It's a global crisis, but it has a grassroots solution. You and I are the grassroots solution. There are four things that every single landscape can do, actually has to start doing these days. We haven't thought about this in the past, but this is what we all have to do. We have to make our landscapes capture carbon. We've got a, a serious issue with climate change because there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. A third of it has come from chopping down our forests and removing our plants. We have to put them back. And when we do that, they pull carbon out of the atmosphere. That's good. Um, our, our landscapes all have to manage watersheds too. Everybody lives in a watershed, everybody. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed. What's managing the watershed? The plants that we put there. We have to support diverse communities of pollinators on all landscapes because we need pollinators everywhere, not just where there's agriculture, but everywhere because pollinators are pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. 
So even if you don't live next to a farm, you need pollinators on your property. And finally, all of our properties have to support complex food webs that support the animals that run the ecosystems that we all depend on everywhere, not just in parks and preserves. Oaks, by planting an oak, you are addressing three of those four goals. You're capturing carbon, you're managing your watershed, you're supporting a complex food web. The only thing oaks aren't great at is supporting a diverse community of pollinators because they're wind pollinated. But recent research has found that uh, early spring pollinators actually do go and use oak pollen. Uh, they just don't move it and, and, uh, and pollinate the oaks. So uh, our oaks might be contributing more to pollinators than we know. But three out of four isn't bad. Uh, again, another big problem. Despite all their landscape attributes, oaks are in trouble. The old giants that used to be common in our forests are gone. 50% of the oaks in the eastern forests, or the percentage of oaks in, in the eastern forest has been cut in half by 50% in the last century. So there are far fewer oaks now than there used to be. 28 of our 91 North American oak species are threatened. One third of global oaks are endangered. The Oregon white oak, just for example, Quercus garyana has less 97% of its range for one reason, we've chopped them all down. Uh, you know, it's not disappearing for any other reason. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And you might have read recently that they're rebuilding Notre Dame with the big oak uh, um, beams that all burned. They're gonna take, what was it, a thousand oak oaks of big oaks from from France to do that probably the last thousand that are that are there we humans live out our lives during a very brief instant in ecological time and we can't return those big ancient oaks and turn around our forest uh, uh, percentage of oaks in our, our forests or our landscapes during that instant but we can start the process in a blink of time, the, the oaks that we plant today will be large enough to fully assume their keystone positions in, in our yards. They won't be hundreds of years old, but they'll be totally functional, but only if we plant them. Thanks very much. Thanks, Doug. We have a number of questions for you today. Are you ready? I'm ready. Should I okay. stop screen sharing here? Sure. Terrific. Okay, so thank you to everybody for questions. We will get started. So what is the, be one question, what is the best oak species for pollinators in the Northeast? <laughs> Remember, oaks are wind pollinated and the, the um, observations that our pollinators are using oak pollen, it's, it's really just a few people are just starting to look at it. So I can't answer that question. Um, no idea. I'm going to try to get some pictures myself. Somebody who may have an idea would be Sam Drogi at uh, Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. He's the one that was noticing this. And I don't know if he has enough data to com comment on that. But and I think you another question here um, that uh, if folks support the countless pollinators and are wind pollinated, is the larva of pollinating insects the benefit, you know, um, do the adult pollinators utilize uh, oak flowers, I guess, is the question. Um, well, oaks, you know, have, have male flowers and they have female flowers. So the male flowers, the catkins, are what's producing the pollen. And um, yeah, any, any bee that goes to this pollen and gathers it up will take the pollen and then feed the larvae, yes. So another question about a bare oak. And what about a bare oak for small oak option? Mm -hmm. That's one, yep. Um, I don't know. Is that in the trade? If it is, that's great. If it isn't, it should be. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the number of questions here about what is the smallest variety of oak that can be purchased and what would the height be of some of the smaller ones? Uh, again, the, the one that you can walk out and buy today would be Crocus prinoides, the dwarf chestnut oak. Um, I planted in, uh, I've got 20 year old dwarf chestnut oaks on my property now and they're about 10 feet tall. So, and they're never going to get huge. That's the, that's the key. So there, there are a number of questions here about leaf litter. And uh, one focuses here on 
How do I keep the dirt hospitable for other plants when the ground beneath my oaks in my yard is either moss or bare dirt? Keep the leaves on them. <laughs> uh, you don't want bare dirt. That That is going to destroy everything. Moss is good. I mean, moss shows that you don't have very much uh, sunlight there and you've got enough moisture. Uh, but a heavy heavy bank of leaf litter will will destroy your moss as as well. So um, it's a it's a compromise. A lot of people work very hard to get moss moss gardens, but the best way to to prevent bare ground is to is to have that leaf litter. And if you're trying to shrink the area of lawn, which I talk about a lot in other other talks, the best way to start a new bed around a tree is to load that leaf litter there and kill, kill the grass. You don't need herbicide to kill the grass. Just let the leaf litter lay there for a year or so and then plant right through it. So you can get instant beds with, with leaf litter. And again, oaks is the best. The reason I say it's the best is because things like maple leaf litter or birch leaf litter or tulip tree leaf litter, they don't make it through the season. They disintegrate and, and uh, you, go, you do go through a period where there's, there's uh, bare ground. And a number of questions about the actual leaves. Do we, you know, some one mentioned here, we leave our leaves, but it's hard to have a woodland garden because they get so deep. And, you know, we, we keep our, we put some of those leaves in other garden beds and, uh, you know, that idea of a mulcher. Do we use a mulcher after the weather is warm, putting the mulch back into the wood beds? Uh, what would you recommend? Use of whole leaves versus mulched leaves? A lot of questions. You mulch the leaves. When you grind them up, you grind up everything in those leaves. 94% uh, of the, the caterpillars that use oaks drop from the ground into the leaf litter and either tunnel under the ground or spin a cocoon in it. So you're, you're um, grinding all that stuff up when you, when you mulch them. And of course, that's exactly what we don't want to do. Uh, a lot of those are little little creatures that you may not appreciate, but you're grinding up your, your, any of the cocoons that are down in there to, so if you grind up every leaf, uh, a sweet gum leaf, you're grinding up your tulip tree or your, your luna moth. And um, so grinding, eh, I don't know, it's not necessary. Whole leaves is what we, what we want to, to use. Um, what was the first part of the question? Well, I think, Doug, the question was, um, number one, if you have a woodland garden. Oh, oh, right, and right, you right. have a tremendous amount of, of, of leaf litter, do we? Right. Right. But you know, uh, if you go, I remember hikes I took, I used to, you know, I got my PhD at University of Maryland, and we used to go into, there was a, a mountain called Old Rag in the, it's along the Skyline Drive, and it's the, the first big mountain you come through, and it was within, you know, an hour and a half drive, and we would hike up there in the spring, it would be a a, you know, an endless bed of trilliums that were up and blooming right through the oak leaf litter and all of the spring ephemerals are there. Nobody's managing that leaf litter and the spring ephemerals get to come up anyway. The time that you can really clobber them is if you pile five feet of leaves there, of course they can't come up through that. So you want a normal layer of, of oak leaves. Uh, and, you know, I know what you're saying. If you pile them all in one place, it's a problem, but my son bought a house two years ago, I guess. And the first fall he called me up and he said, uh, he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do? I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. If you, if you don't have enough flower beds for your leaves, you need more flower beds. You need less lawn uh, because remember, you can't leave the leaves on the lawn. It will, will kill the lawn, but um, Want to keep all those leaves on site, or you know, if you if you really have a lot of leaves, make a, a compost uh, bed, and you can actually compost them, and and you know that's a different use of the leaves, but uh, then you can spread the compost uh, in a couple couple of years. So, Doug, and you know, people, a lot of folks on this call are advocates and communities, and one question is about: Do you know of any ordinances that require? leaving the leaves in backyards. What a clever question. I do not. It'd be great. But you know, you can leave them in the front yards too, in the <laughs> beds. It's, I don't like the, the term backyard habitat because it suggests it's so ugly that we can't do it in the front yard too. You know, a magnificent oak tree in your front yard is just fine. It's the bed under the tree that would be the new addition. Uh, and um, 
leaves are an important part of that, but you can plant right through it. You know, you get a, a the ideal mulch is plant material. You can't even see the ground. So that's what you're striving for. The leaves will be under all of that. And, and so before we move on from the leaf litter, one very specific question is timing. If we're balancing that, um, that leaving leaving the leaves and, and deciding to mulch them and, and share them across the property, what is the best time, Doug? The best time to move them and leave them? Yes. Move them in the fall, when they fall, because uh, um, that, uh, they're just, you know, they're dry, that's the easiest time to, to move them around. A lot of people think that uh, there's this, this urban legend floating around that after you've had several days of 50 degrees, it's okay to cut down everything in your yard and grind up all the leaves because all the insects have emerged. That's not even close to true. Only the very first ones have, have emerged, but insects emerge in a sequence from March all the way through into September. There, there, there are insects that don't come out until fall. So there's no time you can, quote, clean up without killing something. Um, and that's why for, for people that have meadows and things, we suggest you do a third, a third, a third. You only manage, you, you mow or burn one third of your, your meadow each year. So the two thirds are untouched and those two thirds will recolonize the third that you did, did treat. And people say, no, I have to mow to control all the woody plants in my, my uh, meadow. Mowing is not the way to control your woody plants because it doesn't control them. It cuts them back, but it doesn't kill the root stocks. And as soon as you stop mowing, they come up like like gangbusters. You have to spot treat those woodies to keep it a meadow. It's hard to do meadows in this, this part of the world because we get enough rain that it, it wants to be a forest. And you know, the forest is gonna be is all those invasive plants that invade all the time. So we have to, we have to control them, but mowing isn't the way to do that. Thanks, Doug. So question about the lanternfly, a few questions here. Um, what, what danger would the lanternfly pose to oaks? Not much. Um, but <laughs> lanternflies as adults, um, eat, they love fruit, they love grapes, um, they'll suck on a lot of things, but, uh, they're, they're, you know, fruits are not chemically protected. So they're clobbering the apple industry. They're clobbering the grape industry. Um, they're not going to clobber oaks, but they can lay their eggs on oaks. Uh, I, I, particularly oaks that have grapevines growing through them. And I have discovered with the lanternflies at my own house this year that they seem to lay their eggs gregariously. So if one female lays one place, a bunch of females will lay there. So if you find one egg mass, look around, there's probably a whole bunch. And this is the time of year, scrape them off right now before they hatch. Once they hatch, it's hard to, hard to track those little guys down. So it's spend an hour or two looking around your property, finding every egg mass you can and scrape them off. A couple of questions here about how to germinate an acorn to have it grow into a tree. Is there a way to protect? Um, the red oak group germinates in the spring. The white oak group germinates in the fall. So you have to know which acorn you have. Uh, if it's a white oak, uh, a member of the white oak group, so that would be white oak or post oak or chestnut oak uh, or, or um, swamp white oak. You want to put it either in a pot and let it germinate in the pot so that you transplant it the next year, or if you're going to put it straight into the ground, you have to do that in the fall so that when it sends down that radical, uh, you're not going to move it after that. I recommend going in a pot because uh, the, the mice will be after that acorn all winter long and they're very effective. So uh, I, have, I have gone to doing it in pots. You even have to protect them from the mice in your pot as you overwinter it because they will, they will get in there too. And, and uh, just be clever about it, how you can do it. Don't keep them inside though. It's gotta be, gotta be cold. Don't keep them in your garage where you get no rain because then they'll desiccate. So it's a challenge. It's some kind of wire cage or something, but then you plant them in the spring and everything will be great. And then all you have to protect them from is the deer after that. But you do because deer love them. The red oak uh, acorns are just are easier, it seems to me, because uh, you can collect them in the fall and, and put them maybe in a bunch of peat moss and a bucket in your refrigerator and then just throw them out in the spring. Uh, I remember I, I, there was a place I used to give blood that had some big, they weren't big, they were, they were um, 
actually pretty small red oaks in the parking lot, but they made a ton of acorns one year and I couldn't, they were all over the ground. I couldn't bear to drive away without them. So I threw a whole bunch of them in the car, came home and then I just, I walked and just threw them out. Uh, and now this was the fall. I'm amazed at how many of those made it. They, they, wherever they landed, no special treatment at all. They germinated. And a lot of the red eggs I, I have on the acorn on the property came from that, that one blood giving event, but. Doug, another question, something about leaf scorch. Could you talk a little bit about leaf scorch in, in oaks? Yeah, oak leaf scorch uh, is attacking the red oak group uh, more than the white oak group. If you move a little farther west, then, then the white oak group has oak wilt. So they both had their problems, but um, you know, the, uh, we have a lot of forest trees that have disease problems or insect problems. And a, a standard response from foresters seems to be, well, don't plant them anymore or cut them all down or we'll plant something that's resistant. Um, meaning a different species like the Chinese ash, is resistant to emerald ash borer. So we'll only plant Chinese ashes. That negates what, what ashes are doing uh, entirely. Ashes support 95 species of, of insects and you plant the Chinese ash and you're gonna lose all of them. So that, that just defeats the purpose. We do want to find resistant varieties, but the, reason, the way to do that is to keep planting as many of these as we can. And a very small percentage of them will have natural resistance. I don't know what the percentage for oak leaf scorch is. I think it's pretty high actually, because I look at the oaks on my property. I've lost two or three at this point, but a whole bunch are doing just fine. So there must be some resistance there. Um, if I just said, well, I'm never gonna plant a red oak or a pin oak again, uh, I would I would lose the opportunity to get that resistance. We did that with the chestnut. When the chestnut blight came through, we logged every one of them and lost a wonderful opportunity to find a few that were resistant. Uh, so, uh, so you know the the you know the advice: don't ever plant an ash again. I don't I don't go for that. Don't put it next to the house, and it probably will die. But uh, some of them are going to be resistant. There are ashes in, in Michigan that have turned out to be resistant. And those are the genotypes that are going to take over. With oaks, the, the, the um, blue jays are really helping us in this regard because the trees that don't die are the ones that make the acorns. And those are the acorns that the blue jays are distributing. So immediately we have resistant varieties being planted all over by, by the blue jays, but only if they're in our landscapes. Thank you, Doug. And so there are a number of questions here about um, marcescence. And so one of the questions is, is there an energy related burden to marcescence? Um, you mean it takes energy to, to hold them on the tree? I don't think so. Marcescence occurs when the, the hormone that causes abscission of the leaf uh, is, is held back. So they're simply sitting there. Um, but whether they drop in the fall or the spring energetically, and I'm guessing here, I am not a plant physiologist, but I'm guessing there's no real difference in terms of, of energy allocation. It's simply the timing of when that, that hormone that causes abscission is released. And another question, any connection between the health of the tree and the size of the mast? Well, a mass takes a lot of, of energy. So a big tree is going to have a, a, a bigger mast. Um, and it, there's a cost in that uh, it probably won't have grown very much that year. And it may be two or three years before it has enough energy to do another mass. It probably will be two or three years. There's rarely do you have two mass in a row. Um, so that's that, that trade-off, uh, the energy allocation hypothesis. There's not enough energy to go around. So if you do one thing one year, it, it, it costs you in terms of uh, either growth or reproduction. You know, oaks don't produce acorns at all until they reach a certain certain level. So the, uh, you know, the white oak in my front yard that we followed today is this year, it's 20 years old. Um, it made a few white oak acorns last year, but just a few. We certainly haven't had a mass with that tree yet. So it's reaching the, the age where it's going to flower uh, more productively and, and make, uh, make acorns. But, you know, that's, that's 20 years old before it does that. 
So a couple of questions about um, planting oaks, and one is specifically focused on dwarf oaks. You mentioned planting in pairs or groups. Should people also take that approach with dwarf oaks? Well, dwarf oaks are certainly less vulnerable to the high winds that hit hit taller oaks. We're probably not worried they're going to fall on our, our houses. So um, that's the reason we do that is to prevent that damage from falling trees. So um, there's no advantage to the tree other than not being blown over by by being, you know, planting close to each other. So no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, are there any insects or diseases that are killing oaks? Yeah, um, we talked about oak scorch. We talked about oak uh, wilt. There's sudden oak death syndrome in the West, which is clobbering a lot of the California oaks. Um, and if, if I looked it up, I'm sure I could find other oak diseases that we have brought into this country from other countries. Uh, and it's a real issue in terms of, of, of insects. You know, there are, there are um, longhorn beetles, serambicid beetles, oak, it's called the oak girdler, which will girdle and cause flagging. I don't know of any outbreaks where it's actually killing them. Those, uh, there are records of walking sticks in West Virginia in particular that have gotten so numerous that they occasionally defoliate. Uh, but it's it's rare. I've never seen it. Nothing anybody's worried about. The biggest oak killer, of course, is the gypsy moth that has been here for, uh, you know, more than 100 years. Uh, and like other insects we bring into this country, it's here without any of its natural enemies. Uh, so it there's no natural checks on it. And it if we have um, a dry period, Dry periods are hard on any tree, but it's also the trigger for, uh, if it's in the right part of their cycle, it's a trigger for a gypsy moth outbreak. So you, you're hitting the tree from two directions. You defoliate it the same year that you don't have a lot of rain. When we do have a lot of a cool, wet spring, and you know we're on the way for that this year, which is good, that suppresses gypsy moth. There's a fungus that has made its way from Europe to here and it controls the gypsy moth really well when you have a cool wet spring but when you have a dry spring um, it can be a problem and there are places in new england where you know the gypsy moth has been numerous and there's a lot of egg masses out there we need a a cool wet spring or maybe two or three in a row to really knock those populations back down <clears throat> but yes that's certainly a, a an insect that's causing huge problems Thank you that you just answered a number of the questions in our in our q a here around the gypsy moth so doug we have just a few more questions for you here uh and then we'll be wrapping up but people are very interested in knowing a little bit more about the endangered species of oaks that that uh they can consider planting would you let us know about those again you had mentioned a couple or people could go back would you recommend they go back and listen to the recording and take notes no, i didn't i didn't give you any specific examples the the um that list of small trees mm -hmm. that i had there that's on there uh and and some of those are are um have very small distributions they're the problem is that they're in a very confined range several of the species in the west have a very confined range um i'd have to go back and track down which ones really do uh, there's, I know there's uh, a couple of species in Georgia where they're only found on, on certain mountains and a very small range. Um, those are the ones that, of course, are at risk because if that one area is developed, then it's then it's lost. But I no, I'd have to I'd have to look it up myself. Um, hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's a guy named Guy Sternberg. He's actually rewriting uh, a, a book about oaks right now. He's the one who knows all this stuff. When I, if I if I need to find that information, I talk to Guy Guy Sternberg. Terrific, Doug. Thanks so much. You know, one question here: someone was mentioning, boy, will they have seven rock oaks in a group on a rocky ledge? Are they common in Connecticut that you know of? I don't know what a rock oak is. I know that chestnut oak likes to grow on very shallow, rocky soils like that. So that would be my guess that it, they're chestnut oaks. But, um, and that, you know, that brings up a good point. You want to put an oak, they'll grow even in inappropriate places, but they do best when you put them where they really want to be. 
Um, so the white oak group does better on thin thin soils. White oaks do, do pretty well on, on pretty thin rocky soils. Chestnut oaks definitely do. That's where you usually see them. The pin oak is it's called the, you know, it's it's uh, Quercus palustris, oak of the swamp. It usually likes deeper, wetter soils. So knowing which type of soil you have, it can help you pick the oaks that are going to do best. I have a question about, you just answered the question about uh, do oaks like wet feet? So uh, the different varieties have different growing uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, one question about beneficial, uh, beneficial, oh, are oaks beneficial for honeybees? Nah. There you go. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I think okay. the bees that are using that oak pollen in this is just briefly in the spring during when the catkins are out. And the examples I've heard about have all been native bees. So honeybees uh, are going to be going to more traditional flowers. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about. Honeybees are non native for sure. That's right. They're not native, but you know, they're oaks in Europe too. So they could have had a relationship. I just don't think they do. A question about um, trimming oaks. Mm. Um, some people are thinking, you know, how do I maintain an oak so that it doesn't get too big? What would be your recommendation for that mm. if you would recommend that? You know, if you have an oak species that wants to be big, it, they don't take well to pruning the way a hedge does. Um, you know, it's, I don't know. I've never seen anybody try to make an oak hedge, but I have seen people make beech hedges which are in the phagaceae, they're related to oaks, and that does work. So, you know, when I say, oh, that won't work, maybe, maybe you know, maybe it would work. I have never seen anybody try it. I, I think it'd be better to choose one of those smaller oaks and rather than trying to keep it small. Uh, and let me bring up, um, when you prune an oak, if you have to prune an oak, uh, it can determine whether or not it's gonna get oak wilt. I think the only time to prune an oak uh, and you know, when oak will is not going to attack it is, well, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think it's dead, dead of winter. You don't want to prune it when there's live material on there because that makes it very susceptible to uh, oak will. A, a number of questions here um, about understory shrubs or companion plantings for oaks. What advice would you give? I'm writing these things down. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you know, most oaks with the tannin and lignans that are in their leaves acidify the soil. So putting things that like acid soils underneath oaks is a good match. Uh, so any of your ericaceous plants, blueberries, for example, which are excellent landscape plants, by the way, uh, any of our uh, azaleas, and we've got a lot of species of native azaleas, uh, would do well under, under oaks. Um, but there's a lot, you know, look in the book, there's a lot of species that, that prefer uh, more acidic soils and they would all do well under, under oaks. There are oaks that grow in the, the you know, the uh, basic soils of Ohio though too. So, it, so uh, that's a generality. There are oaks that will do well in basic soils as well. A lot of interest on the call on what type of oak to plant in what condition. Uh, in soil condition and location. Um, any advice for how people would, would kind of connect to that information? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, here, question, hang on, I, I, I actually do, I do, here. Okay, here we See go. See this book here? <laughs> it's called Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for Eastern United States by Tony Dove and Ginger Woolworth. Uh, it's a good book to have because in the beginning are very extensive charts about which trees and shrubs will do well in different situations. Um, so that's the best resource I have seen in terms of, of really nailing all of that, that uh, information. It's, it's, it's better than you know, what, what Rick and I did. Don't tell him I said that. Um, so that'd be my recommendation. The Essential Trees and Shrubs of Eastern North America by Tony Dove and, Winger, and Ginger Woolworth. Fantastic. Doug, thank you so much. I know we kind of put you on the spot there. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> remember i'm an entomologist i don't know about plants <laughs> so many followers here that just appreciate and the gratitude is pouring out through 
both the Q and A and the and the chat here. So I uh, really appreciate um, what you have to say here. And so one question came up about um, how to help oaks in times of, of drought. How can we best water oaks during times of drought? You know, if we have a drought serious enough to um, really hurt a, a well-planted oak, that's a serious drought. And I have seen that. I've seen that in Virginia where oak leaves were actually wilting in a, in a natural forest. I've only seen it once. Um, and, you know, I don't know. They have huge, huge root systems. Um, I, I guess you get out the hose and water them, I guess. But I think the, the real, the real, most of the time, and I'm talking about, you know, most of the conditions, if you have allowed the root systems to uh, be fully developed, you don't have to worry about that because they're, they can tap into water all over the place. When you transplant a large oak and it doesn't have a big root system, that's an issue. And you see those, those plastic uh, self-watering uh, things that are wrapped around transplanted trees that'll water them for, I don't know, um, the first month or something automatically. But um, it's a good reason to plant very small to let those root systems get big. And then you never have to worry about it. Doug, thank you so much. So many questions and so much interest and so much support pouring out to everyone on this call, to each other and gratitude to you. Uh, so with that, we're gonna wrap up this Q&A and pass it back over to Mel. Thank you so okay. much, Doug. You're welcome. Great, thank you, Jean, and thank you, Doug. This was spectacular, as always. I learned so much every time I hear you speak. I especially love the skill you have of rapid fire caterpillar naming. That's one of my favorite parts of your this, talk. This is still a very young talk. It's got some rough edges here. We'll have to work on that. Oh, but, well, but it <laughs> was you know, wonderful. you got to start sometime. So <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. I learned so much and have new respect for the oaks on my property and in the world. So good. Um, good. We got a great uh, comment from somebody who I think just encapsulated everything she said. Uh, Joy says, Doug, you are our best hope. <laughs> you not only give well, I say, Joy, you are our best hope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all are. We all are. She we said, are. you not only give us the information we need, but you re-energize us to get out there and keep promoting and pushing this important mission. Thank you. Good. So Good. it's just wonderful that you shared your Sunday with us. And um uh, for those of you out there who uh, are, are members of the Land Trust and those who are not yet, I'm encouraging you to become members because last spring, Doug walked his property for us and took all of these little videos of uh, his observations of his backyard, of things that were um, blooming and awakening, and um, we're calling them Talamy Tidbits. So we've curated them into little clusters. And during the month of April, we're gonna share the Talamy tidbits um, with our members, uh, one grouping at a time. So uh, if you have not gotten enough of Doug today, which I know I haven't, um, just become a member of the Land Trust and we will, we will send the Talamy tidbits to you during the month of April. So uh, looking forward to spring and uh, looking forward to uh, getting back out there and I learned so much today and thank you, Doug. You were amazing as always. And we appreciate this rare opportunity to have you spend Sunday with us. Well, thank you, Bill. And thanks for listening, everybody. Okay. All right. Take care. Great. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.